for the organizers for the invitation and also for putting together this weekend. Um, so I'm going to be telling you about obstructing Lagrangian components for three braids. Um, and this talk is going to come in two parts because I have 30 minutes and I couldn't think of any good puns. Um, the parts are one, the problem. So I'm going to tell you what the problem is and two, the proof ish because I'm not, I, I don't have time to tell you the whole proof. I'm just sort of going to outline it, maybe talk a little bit about the more topological parts and then wave my hands around um, and lie a little. So hope you're excited. Um, so let's get started with the problem. So what is Lagrangian concordance? Well, Lagrangian concordance, uh, one way to phrase it, maybe if you're from low dimensional topology is that it's the symplectic version of the smooth concordance problem. Um, and in the setting of uh, symplectic geometry, um, the definition that I'm using for Lagrangian concordance comes from Schoenfrain. So before I define concordance, uh, let's first define cobordism. So let lambda minus and lambda plus be Legendrian knots in R3 with the standard contact structure. And then a Lagrangian cobordism from lambda minus to lambda plus is going to be an embedded Lagrangian surface L in R4 such that um, these two equations hold. And what these two equations mean is that the surface has these cylindrical ends going off into infinity. So between the two knots, something interesting might be happening. You might get some genus, but you know, past a certain point, you just have sort of cylinders going off in either direction. Okay. So the concordance then is the genus version, uh, genus zero version of cobordism. So if a Lagrangian cobordism has genus zero, then it is a Lagrangian concordance. Um, if there is a Lagrangian concordance from lambda minus to lambda plus, then we say lambda minus is concordant to lambda plus, and we write this sort of less than symbol. I was always, the first time I ever learned it, um, they told me it was called ducky less than because you can draw a duck with the less than. Okay, so anyways, we'll move on. So the question that you might ask is uh, which Legendrians, lambda minus and lambda plus satisfy lambda minus is concordant to lambda plus? And the answer is, well, we know some things. So for instance, um, Chantrain proved that Legendrian isotopic Legendrians are concordant to each other. So for example, if I have the unknot and then I have you know, a special a knot, then there's a concordance that way. Um, in a separate paper, he also proved that um, so uh, that concordance is not symmetric. So we know that concordance is reflexive, it's transitive, but it's not symmetric. And so he, the way he does this is by constructing an example. So in particular, he shows that the unknot is concordant to uh, this knot, which I've drawn incorrectly. Let me try again. Uh, it goes like this, and then like this. Oh gosh. Okay, you know what? I'm just going to write it down. It's the mirror of the 946 uh, knot. So he constructs a concordance one way, and then he proves using augmentations that there's no uh, concordance the other way. So this is how we prove that it's not symmetric. And so you might ask then, is concordance anti-symmetric? So if lambda one is concordant to lambda two and lambda two is concordant to lambda one, does that mean that lambda one is lambda two? Um, in other words, you might ask if the concordance relation is a partial order on Legendrian knots, right? And so if you ask these questions, the answer is we don't know. Um, so maybe you ask an easier question. Maybe you ask the question, uh, so for you, the 
max TV legendrian unot, so TV minus one legendrian unot. If u is concordant to lambda is concordant to u, then is lambda equal to u? So you simplify the question, you ask it just for the unknot. Um, so the question is, you know, what lives here? And the answer again is we don't know. <laughs> so, um, but there are some people who have done some work on finding obstructions. So some of the obstructions are fairly, you know, easy to get. So for instance, um, we know that lambda must be quasi-positive. And the reason for this is that if I have, let's erase the question mark and put in just like a scribble to represent some sort of knot, right? If I have some scribble here and I have this Legendrian unknot at the end here, I can fill the Legendrian unknot with a Lagrangian disk, right? And that means that I have this Lagrangian disk that fills the, the, the knot in the middle as well. So the knot in the middle is this Lagrangian slice. Um, and it follows from results of Boileau and Orefkov that if something is Lagrangian slice, then it has to be quasi-positive. Um, this disk, which is Lagrangian, is also smooth. So we also know that it's smoothly sliced. So we can use smooth um, obstructions to slice this as well. Uh, lambda must have TB is equal to minus one. So this is another uh, obstruction from child train. And then I should mention that there's a whole bunch of other obstructions coming from Cornwell, Ng, and Seebeck. Um, these include things like the knot cannot be alternating, the, uh, what's it called? The concordance can't be decomposable, stuff like this. Um, but this is the sort of answer that we have. We have a bunch of obstructions. And so the result that I want to share with you is basically another obstruction. Um, and it's the following. So if lambda satisfies u is concordant to lambda is concordant to u, and lambda is smoothly the closure of a three braid, then lambda is u. So basically, I'm knocking out all of the three braids other than the unknot itself. Okay. Um, so. How do I prove this? Um, so here I'm going to sort of explain the, the idea of the strategy, right? So instead of considering lambda and u and R3, I'm first going to consider them in S3. I can just sort of add a point to R3 and make sure the knots are sort of far away from it, and that's fine. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this Legendrians with Lagrangian um, cylinder sort of picture. I'm just going to perturb it a little bit. I'm going to take a push off of the whole thing. And what I'm going to have is I'm going to have transverse knots instead of uh, Legendrian ones. And I'm going to get this like, sort of symplectic approximation of the Lagrangian cylinder. And then what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to uh, look at covers of these spaces. So in particular, I'm going to look at the double cover of S3 branched over U and branched over lambda. The double cover of S3 branched over U is just S3. And so what I'm really going to do is I'm going to obstruct this uh, symplectic cobordism from S3 to the double cover, or here P is equal to two here, the double cover of lambda to S3. So I'm going to obstruct sort of this cobordism instead. And that's the sort of strategy here. Um, and oh, one more thing I wanted to say is like, why, why am I thinking about braids? Why is this like a reasonable thing to ask? And uh, the answer is twofold. So the first thing is that um, any quasi-positive Legendrian lambda has a transverse push-off lambda prime of the same smooth knot type and transversely isotopic to a transverse quasi-positive braid of minimal index. So this follows from some results um, by OS, Sprinkle, and Hayden. Um, but basically, the idea is that transverse knots are very braidy, right? Uh, we can capture a lot of the information of the transverse knots, of transverse knots by talking about their braid types. 
And the reason why you pick three, uh, three braids as opposed to any other index is because of this result. I think it showed up on Friday as well from Laura Sugi, which basically says I could write them all down, right? Uh, so any three braid up to conjugation is going to be equivalent to one of these three types. So I'm going to call them type one, type two, and type three. All right, so this is why we're working with braids. It's because it's like a tractable thing that we can do. Um, and so, yeah, this is now part two. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the proof. Um, I might run out of time towards the end, in which case I will wave my hands even faster and then we'll just, we'll just end the talk. Um, so the first part of the proof is going to be using really these Murasugi words. So I'm going to show that if lambda is the closure of a three braid beta satisfying u is concordant to lambda is concordant to u, then beta has to have algebraic length two. So that means if I take the braid generators and I add up their exponents, it's two. Um, and the second part is that I'm going to draw the Weinstein diagram of a filling of sigma two of lambda prime using an open book decomposition coming from beta. So using the braid, I'm going to come up with a Weinstein diagram for a filling of the double cover of lambda. And then using this Weinstein diagram, I'm going to compute uh, the chekhanov eliashford PGA of the attaching spheres in the Weinstein diagram. And I can use this to then compute um, symplectic invariance of the filling. So in particular, I'm going to use this to show that the symplectic homology of uh, this filling is non-zero, and from there I'm going to get a contradiction with this concordance property. So that's the strategy, or that's the sort of layout of the proof. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the steps, and I'm going to skip the rest of them. So part one is um, just shaving the fat off. So we're going to eliminate braids of type two and three. This is um, Step one. So braids of type two, which are of this form, I can eliminate for the following reason. Let me just sort of draw a heuristic diagram for you. So these braids are all going to look something like this. All right, and you can see right away that I can eliminate them because they're going to be at least two component lengths. Okay. Um, so now let's take a look at braids um, of Murasugi type three. So I'm going to eliminate all of these except for the case where uh, D is equal to one and K is equal to minus three because that's the unknot. Um, but all of the other cases I'm going to throw out for the following reason. So I told you before that the knot has to be quasi positive, right? So that means that D has to be greater than zero because otherwise it's all negative generators. That's not quasi positive, goodbye. Okay, um, the other result that I'm going to use is an obstruction to smooth sliceness, which says that um, it follows from, result of two people <laughs> whose names I forget. Uh, that if something is smoothly sliced and not the unknot, then it has to be strongly quasi-positive, which means, um, or sorry, it can't be strongly quasi-positive, which means um, like instead of conjugates of positive generators, it's a conjugate of a positive band. Um, and in particular, positive, braids are strongly quasi-positive. And so all I have to do is take this braid word and manipulate it so that all of like to an equivalent braid where all of the generators are positive and I can throw those out. So basically I can do this. I can prove that none of these are quasi-positive but not strongly quasi-positive. So I can throw out all of those. So that just leaves me with uh, Murasugi braids of type one. All right, um, and Unfortunately, like that's the, <laughs> that's most of them. So 
uh, what do I do? Well, now I'm going to start to think about um, sort of more the ambient geometry around these knots to try to do things. So first I'm going to prove the lemma, which says that if lambda satisfies this concordance, then any p-fold cover um, is going to embed as a contact type hypersurface in the four ball. So um, if you recall from previous talk, contact type hypersurface just means like a contact manifold with Uville vector field pointing outward transversely. So um, I'm going to prove this, and then I'm going to use this to prove that uh, the D3 of the contact structure of the double cover is equal to minus two. So D3 is an invariant, which was introduced by Gompf, um, and it's an invariant of plane fields. And so basically using sort of um, this lemma, I'm going to prove this. And the neat thing about D3 is that um, it can be entirely determined by the self-linking number and the topological link type of the, of the knot as well. So from there, I'm going to sort of uh, limit which, which of, which of uh, these Murasugi type one braids have D3 is equal to minus one. And I'm going to get that lambda has to be of, um, the, of has to be a Murasugi type one braid satisfying this equation. And then from there, I get that they have to have algebraic length too. So I'm skipping over like a lot of details, <laughs> but I think they're not too interesting. Um, sort of the interesting thing that happens is at the next step. So I basically throw out all of the braids that aren't algebraic length two, and now I just need to think about, so what if I do have an algebraic length two braid? Uh, what does that look like? And what I do is I actually show uh, the following theorem. So if lambda, which is not the end knot, is the closure of a quasi-positive three braid with algebraic length two, oh, this is supposed to say the double cover, then the double cover of lambda has a filling, which I'm going to call X lambda, um, with the following Weinstein handle decomposition. So Weinstein handle decomposition is like handle decomposition, but in the symplectic world. Um, so we have these pairs of balls, which are the attaching spheres for the one handle. We have Legendre knots, which are attaching spheres for the two handles. And here, what I mean by these sort of like shaded green and blue regions, I just mean like a bunch of parallel curves. Um, I don't know how many would have drawn them in here, but basically it's going to look something like this. Some number of parallel curves. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, the first step is to do something easy. Um, and it's to show that if lambda is the closure of a quasi-positive grade with algebraic length to beta, then beta is equivalent up to conjugacy to a braid of the form sigma one B, sigma one B inverse. So B is some braid um, of sigma ones and sigma twos. And I can always you know, find an equivalent braid of this form. So for example, um, I can take a look at this braid, the, sorry, this knot, which is the mirror of the 820 knot. Um, and this one, I'm going to be right, uh, able to write as the form sigma one, sigma two, to the three, sigma one, sigma two, to the minus three. So I'm writing, you know, whatever braid in, in this form. Okay, from there, I'm going to construct an open book decomposition. And this is using an idea from uh, Pamanashkaya. Um, and the idea is the following. So the contact structure of this double cover will be compatible with an open book decomposition, F phi, where F is going to be a punctured torus, and phi is going to be given by Dane twist corresponding to the braid word. So in the braid word, when I see a sigma one, that's going to give me a Dane twist about alpha, which is this curve that I've drawn here. This is a punctured torus. I guess I should give it a puncture somewhere. Um, and when I see a sigma two in the braid word, that's going to correspond to a tau beta. So a Dane twist about alpha or a Dane twist about beta. And then, so I just sort of 
follow the braid word and do these Dane twists. And that gives me the monogamy of the open book. Okay, um, and so for example, oh, sorry, so the, mono, the monogamy of the open book is going to correspond to Dane twists about alpha and some curve gamma of slope P over Q. So some non-separating curve gamma. Um, the re reason for this is that I can take the first sigma one, right? And that's going to correspond to a Dane twist about alpha. So Dane twist about alpha, which is this one zero curve. And then I can take the like next part, this B sigma one, B inverse. And that's going to be equivalent to a Dane twist about the curve um, alpha Dane twisted B inverse times, like by B inverse. So for, for instance, for sigma two to three, sigma one, sigma two to three, this is going to be a Dane twist about the curve, which I get by Dane twisting alpha about beta minus three times. Okay. <laughs> so what does this look like? It looks like um, this. So this is going to be my gamma, um, which is a curve of slope one, three. So basically the monogamy of the open book is going to be given by alpha and by some gamma. And the gamma part is really going to be like the, the thing that changes depending on the braid. Okay, so now I have the monogamy written in the terms of Dane twists. And what I'm going to use next is the following. So from this open book, I'm going to construct a Weinstein Lefschetz vibration by attaching handles along the lifts of the vanishing cycles, which correspond to alpha and gamma in the generic fiber of F. So um, if you, I don't know, imagine that I have this you know, open book decomposition that lives above this circle um, with these puncture tori. Right, um, then I can sort of construct a Weinstein Lefschetz vibration by sort of filling in this disk. <laughs> um, filling in is the wrong word, I shouldn't use that word, but like extending over this disk and my like overall monogamy of the Lefschetz vibration is going to correspond to the overall monogamy of the open book. And I'm gonna get it by handle attachments along these sort of Dane twisting curves. And so then what I need to do, right, is I need to be able to draw these lifts of these vanishing cycles. Um, and to do this, I use a theorem from a paper by Cassell and Murphy, which gives a correspondence between Dane twists and lifts of parallel minus one and plus one surgery curves. So this is basically going to say, like, if I have a Dane twist, I can draw curves like this. And then I'm going to simplify this diagram using uh, Weinstein Kirby calculus and surgery calculus and whatever. Um, and the thing I end up with is going to be a diagram that looks like this. It's going to be determined by the slope P, Q of gamma. Um, and in particular, it's going to wind around the one handle Q times. Um, and there's going to be P strands um, in the like green over crossing section. Um, this is after simplification. So I've actually like, part of this process is like deleting one of the one handles um, that was in the, in the drawings. So this is going to be the handle decomposition of a Weinstein filling of the double cover of lambda. We're going to call it X lambda. We're going to call the knot in the diagram D of lambda to not confuse it with lambda. So lambda is the original thing in the concordance. D of lambda is this blue and green knot in this picture. So, so in, in this diagram, like it's not, it's not like just the, it's not like you go in one side where you're like green on one side and you come out blue on the other. Like there are some, there might be some overlap where like, as I go into the right, like it, I guess where, like if I'm a green strand and I go into the, into like the right ball, I sort of warp through to the left. Like I could, uh -huh. you might become blue. Yeah. I might become blue, but I also might stay green. Like depending you might on... also stay green. Yeah. Okay. I... I, yeah. Okay. Great. 
great. Yeah, I'm so it, it's kind of confusing, like using two different colors on the same knot, but I, I just wanted to differentiate between these, like over strands and the under strands. Um, so just, let me show you this example. So for um, uh, this mirror of the 820 knot, where PQ is 1, 3, um, I'm going to get, oh, I should just green and blue, right? So uh, one strand like this and two strands like this, right? This is going to be the Weinstein diagram um, of this. Um, it looks like there's a little bit of lag because I can draw it and then like watch myself draw it two, two seconds later. Okay, so, um, all right, uh, let's see. I have three minutes, so I don't have time to explain part three to you. Um, but let me just see how far I can get without telling you any details. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute the Chekhanov Ali Ashberg uh, DGA of D lambda. Um, this is a link invariant. It was first written up by Chekhanov, who used it to distinguish between two knots that weren't distinguishable by classic invariants. Um, it since it's proved to be more useful than that. So it's generated by rabe chords of D lambda. Um, these are going to correspond to the crossings of D lambda as well as an internal GGA inside of the one handle. So inside of the one handle, there's going to be infinitely many rape cores. And so there's sort of a way to account for that. And this was shown by um, Ng and Eckholm, Eckholm and Ng, um, and a simplification was provided by Eku and Wakili. Um, and the differential of the DGA is going to be generated by a count of immersed disks with corners at the rate cores, so either at crossings or like sort of at the one handle. Um, so for example, here's the GGA um, of the external generators of this example that I've been sort of tracking along um, as I described to you this proof. You can kind of see, for example, if I look here at um, B3, the differential of B3, where these disks lie, I have sort of like a C013 here, and then I have one that sort of has a corner at B2, and then at C023, and then I have another one with a corner at B1, and C0, or C023, and then a B1. So this, these are the kinds of disks that are being counted by the differential. Um, and then I'm going to have, you know, these like internal generators. Um, but basically, from this DGA, I'm going to be able to compute some things about the symplectic homology. So um, the symplectic homology of X lambda is going to be a sort of Hofschild-like homology, homology on this DGA. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this DGA to find a cycle um, which is not in the image. And so this is going to show that the symplectic homology is non-zero. And then I'm going to use the fact that the symplectic homology is non-zero to contradict this theorem of McLean, which says that if I have symplectic homology is non-zero, then X cannot embed in a subcritical uh, manifold as a codimension, as an exact codimension zero submanifold. Um, so I'm going to basically say, if I have this concordance, it does embed, and it has non-zero homology, so I have a contradiction. Um, and I'm out of time, so I'm just going to say one more thing um, in case uh, you want sort of something else to bite your teeth on. Um, so this is a corollary of the results. Um, it's inspired by work of Mark and Tosin, which is published in summer last year, I think, or put on the archive in the summer last year, where they're trying to find rational homology spheres that don't embed in R4 um, as contact type hyper hypersurfaces. And they do this for uh, like an infinite family of Riescoin spheres. And so uh, these sort of double covers of S3 branch over a quasi-positive transverse knot with algebraic length two is going to give you another infinite family of rational homology spheres, which do not embed as contact type hypersurfaces R4 uh, with the standard symplectic structure. All right. And that's it. Thanks for listening.
Right, let's thank.